Thank you. Thanks to Saku and Peter for organizing this conference and to the students who oversaw the logistics. So my presentation resonates with some of the other presentations and the conversations we've been having about ethnicity, religion, and nationalism. And it also um, speaks to some of the earlier presentations that had foregrounded the relationship between the colonial era and the contemporary moment. So I'll start. On August 5th, 2019, the Indian ruling party, the Bharatiya Janta Party, announced the revocation of Articles 370 and 35A of the Indian Constitution that had granted special status and limited autonomy to the state of Jammu and Kashmir. This move stripped Jammu and Kashmir of its status as a state, splitting it into two union territories, which will be directly ruled by the center, Indian parlance for the, for the federal government. A day earlier, the Indian government had imposed a curfew on the region along with a communications blockade, cutting off access to the internet, landlines, and cellular service. In the days leading up to the, to the abrogation of the Constitution, the Indian government had deployed 38,000 troops to the region who joined the 700,000 soldiers already stationed there. The massive troop presence has, had previously conferred on Kashmir the dubious distinction of being the most militarized place in the world. Prior to this recent intensification of government repression, the Indian military forces had racked up an appalling record of human rights violations against Kashmiris, including torture, disappearances, sexual violence, and custodial deaths. Since 1989, more than 70,000 people have been killed in the conflict between the Indian government and Kashmiri groups, although the Indian government only admits to about 40,000 of these deaths. Over the years, innumerable young people have also been blinded by the Army's use of pellet guns against those demonstrating in opposition to the Indian state. The BBC, Al Jazeera, The Wire, and The Washington Post have all reported on the dire conditions of Kashmiris living under the most recent round of repression. Mass detentions, at least 4,000 adults and some children by mid-August, severe food shortages, civilian casualties, and life-threatening disruptions to medical services. While the center insists that normalcy has been restored to the region, thousands of Kashmiri children, women, and men continue to defy authorities by protesting in the streets. Resentment and anger against the Indian government is building as Kashmiris assert their right to sovereignty and to lead a dignified life. You might be wondering what relevance these events in Kashmir have to conference on the topic of ethnicity, race, and racism in Asia. I want to argue that Kashmir is very relevant to this conference precisely because the center's authoritarianism and the bellicose support for it by Hindu nationalists enables us to comprehend how the categories of ethnicity and race in South Asia are implicated with religion, regionalism, and nationalism. And Navneet made a similar argument this morning um, when he was speaking about Burma. Among scholars, it has become a truism to assert that race is an ideological construct, construction that has no basis in biology. And yet race has social and political consequences in the world insofar as the production of inequality, not to mention outright repression, is often connected to perceptions of racial difference among groups. Because racism is everywhere a deeply anti-human and anti-social practice, Stuart Hall cautions, that we can be fooled into thinking, quote, it is everywhere the same, either in its forms, its relations to other structures and processes, or its effects, end quote. The construction of race in India is part of a complex discursive formation that includes colonial attitudes, partition violence, regional rivalries between India and Pakistan, and the rise of Hindu nationalism, which together inform the present day actions of the Indian military in Kashmir. My aims in this presentation are threefold. First, I want to explore how the gleeful re responses of Hindu nationalists to the current crisis in Kashmir recycles the partition era conflation of the violent conquest of women with the acquisition of national territory. Second, I want to historicize the representation of Kashmiris in relation to British colonial martial race theory. While the discourse of, about the martial races has been largely analyzed in terms of men and masculinity, I am interested in those rare moments when colonial officials extemporize about the nature of native women. 
And third, I want to suggest that the revocation of Articles 370 and 35A are part of the arsenal of a settler colonial state intent on subjugating Kashmiris in order to seize control of the considerable resources in the state under a capitalist regime of accumulation. To understand recent events in Kashmir, we must revisit the hasty and bloody partition of the subcontinent in 1947 into Pakistan and India. The creation of an Islamic state for Muslims and a nominally secular multicultural democracy was crucially enacted through sexual violence against Hindu, Muslim, and Sikh girls and women in what was the original sin of the birth of two nations. Females experienced partition as a continuum of violence in which their sexuality became the means by which men territori territorialized the two nations, India and Pakistan, within the context of patriarchal ideologies of shame and honor correspondingly aligned with pollution and purity. Through oral histories, Urvashi Butalia, Ritu Menon, and Kamla Basay have recorded the horrific experiences of girls and women who, in some cases voluntarily or under coercion, committed suicide or were murdered by their own kin in a preemptive measure to preserve their sexual purity and maintain their family honor. Men in Hambassin explained that the logic underwriting this form of patriarchal violence was, quote, that actual death is preferable to death in life or the symbolic death of rape, abduction, conversion, end quote. Sometimes girls and women were abandoned or bartered by their natal families in exchange for the safe passage of other family members to either India or Pakistan. Individuals of the opposing religion, in some instances, offered sanctuary to these girls and women, absorbing them into their own families. And in other cases, girls and women were mutilated, abducted, raped, disemboweled, and murdered by men of the opposing religions. The subsequent experiences of some survivors explicitly illustrate the constructiveness of the category of race in South Asia. Recall that a significant number of the girls and women who had been raped later married their perpetrators and resisted the attempts of the Indian and Pakistani states after independence to repatriate and return them to their families. While both countries had posited the girls and women's religious identities as essentially fixed at a time prior to their assaults, the women themselves sometimes assumed new identities occasioned by the transformation of their rapists into husbands and the mutation of violent mobs of an opposing religion into what would become their communities following their marriages. Many of these women fought their repatriation and insisted on the right to forget the terrible wrongs committed against them in the name of sectarian nationalism. In addition to religious conversion, survival for these women depended on historical amnesia and the acquisition of new cultural practices and ethnic traditions and often fluency in a different language. Religion, region, ethnicity, and nationality, in effect, became diffused under a broad rubric of, of identity, together constituting the larger ca category of race. Combing through the oral histories in Butalia's The Other Side of Silence, and Menon and Basin's Borders and uh, Bat Bodies, I am struck by the tension between the assertion of religion as a kind of biological and racial identity on the one hand, and the accounts themselves that demonstrate the instability of this category on the other. Following partition, both the Indian and Pakistani governments were inundated with petitions demanding that they locate and recover missing family members, including abducted girls and women. Even as government officials were confronted with girls and women who had married men of a different faith and did not want to return to their natal families, they subscribed to an essentialist, rigid view of identity. Mainan and Basin point out that requests for the recovery of Hindu women were overlaid by the symbolism of the sacred epic, the Ramayan, the plot of which involves the abduction of King Rama's wife, Sita, by the demon uh, King Ravan, who had become besotted by her beauty. Sita is imprisoned in Ravan's palace, where she resists his attempts at seduction. After rescuing her, Rama rejects Sita on the grounds that she has become defiled by residing un un um, under another man's roof. She must prove her sexual purity to her skeptical husband, first by undergoing a literal trial by fire, and second by beseeching the earth to swallow her as evidence of her chastity. In the logic of the Hindu epic, the preservation of female sexual purity requires the self-annihilation of the woman, a lesson most likely internalized by some of the Hindu and Sikh girls and women who had voluntarily committed suicide to escape their violation by Muslim men. 
The categorization of rape as a violation of purity, and hence a form of pollution, surfaces in the account of an otherwise progressive social worker, Kamla Van Patel, who in 1947 labored on behalf of the Indian state to recover abducted women. She posits an absolute difference between Hindu and Muslim rape survivors. Quote, a Hindi woman feel, felt that she had been made impure, had become sully, was no longer Pati Vrata, and a Pati Vrata is this concept of the chaste, devoted wife for whom the husband is a god. That's the definition. Okay, so it's back to the tale. A Muslim woman did not feel like this. It was not in her blood. It is in our blood. We feel we have been polluted. We are no longer worthy of showing our faces in public." End quote. Here, Patel essentializes cultural attitudes about rape in biological terms, depicting the association of chastity and purity as coursing through the veins of Hindu women. References to the binary opposition of purity and pollution, particularly in the context of bodily fluids, are underwritten by caste hierarchies. Caste restrictions against physical contact and exchange of cooked food maintain social stratification by limiting contact between upper and lower castes as a preventive measure against the contamination of social superiors by their inferiors. For Orthodox believers, all non-Hindus are potential sources of pollution. Sexual assault by a non-Hindu represents a literal contamination of the body because it materializes the symbolic de defilement of chastity. In claiming a monopoly for Hindu women on feelings of shame, moreover, Patel denies that Muslim women might also experience this very <coughs> common response to sexual assault. A simplistic understanding of ideology also informs her view. Hegemonic culture is dominant precisely because of its success in universalizing its attitudes, even if only partially, which are internalized to various degrees by the subcultures within its orbit. Ironically, caste attitudes are a case in point. While Islam is based on an egalitarian ethos, South Asian Muslims have absorbed some of the prejudices of caste, discriminating, for example, against those groups who handle waste. It seems likely that Muslim survivors of rape in India have absorbed the majoritarian insistence on reading their assaults as violations of their purity with the attendant emphasis on shame as the appropriate response to this form of violence. Kamala Van Patel's invocation of blood and the assertion that it is qualitatively different for Hindu and Muslim women echoes colonial martial race theory. After the 1857 Sepoy mutiny, the British colonial state categorized Indians as either martial or non-martial races based on the belief that some groups had a hereditary predisposition to be better warriors than the majority of the native population. While the general population was presumed to lack fighting skills and physical courage, select ethnicities were considered to be natural warriors. As Heather Street notes, quote, the race in martial race increasingly referred to the idea that the ability to make war inhered in the blood of some populations more than in others, that a natural proclivity to arms denoted biological proclivity as well, end quote. Martial race theory combined ideas about climate, physiognomy and physique into gross generalizations about behavior and ultimately character. This discourse contained contradictions. Mountainous people such as the Dogras, Gurkhas, and Patans were classified as martial races, but Kashmiris were not. And if you remember back to John's presentation, he had a slide about immigration into Hong Kong, and he said that one of um, the, the reasons that people emigrated were under the British state in order to populate the army and he also noted that Gurkhas were a significant percentage of that population. Determinations of martial race identity, according to Kashyap Rao, were based on the colonial assessment of the community's courage, capacity for discipline, religion, public spirit, and loyalty to the crown. Indeed, Sir George McMahon's 1933 book, The Martial Races of India, which codifies many of the prevailing ideas about race and military prowess in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, has little to say of Kashmiri men other than they are, quote, hardy, muscular, powerful, enduring, and yet pusillanimous beyond belief, end quote. Beyond a physical description of Kashmiri men, he does not venture. In another colonial racial classification of natives based on anthropometry, uh, and hopefully, uh, maybe many of you do not know what this science was, 
But this was uh, measurements of the nose and head, and it was really popular in race theory from the late 19th century. Uh, okay, so this is popularized by Sir Herbert, Herbert Risley. Kashmiris are slotted into the Indo-Aryan race, joining Punjabis and Rajputs, two ethnicities who are generally kept categorized as superior warriors. The exclu exclusion of Kashmiri Muslims from the register of martial races might be explained by the general British distrust of Muslim soldiers, who had taken a prominent role in the 1857 revolt and also sought Afghan assistance to free India. The discourse of the martial races was a gendered one, focused on categorizing native men according to their potential to be soldiers. Women infrequently get mentioned, except for rare instances, and when they do, they are not differentiated according to religion. Although McMahon does not mention Kashmiri women, he does pontificate on other women from mountainous communities. He generally believes that native women of the martial races are the same, regardless of their religious background. Focusing on, and I'm going to try not to laugh in these descriptions because I do find them somewhat comic. Okay, so focusing on, quote, the strapping lasses of the Punjab, which is also not this region, he volunteers that be they Sikh or Muslim or Dogra or any other kind of yeoman peasant, except for the really high caste Hindu women, all women are much more the same in Punjab than all men, end quote. Two characteristics predominate in this description of these women their beauty and strong work ethic, particularly in terms of agricultural labor. Quote, they are bonny, sonsy, hardworking women, these mothers and wives of men, free of limbs, straight of figure, strapping and comely, stand these brown daughters to be good wives to good husbands, end quote. He doubts that, quote, there are handsomer, comelier women to be seen world over, where good looks and health are more to be prized than finer beauty, end quote. The, their abilities at plastering mud floors, pounding rice and grounding wheat meal, milking cows and goats, and winnowing fresh grain excite McMunn's admiration. Here, female worth is calculated in the commonplace patriarchal registers of beauty and labor contributions to the household economy. In um, Kamala Van Patel's loss on rape survivors that I quoted earlier, the nationalist rewriting of race during partition is both continuous and discontinuous with colonial martial race theory. Continuities in here in the emphasis on blood as the embodiment of racial identity. Discontinuities appear in essentialist constructions of women as Hindus or Muslims on the basis of biological difference when in colonial martial race theory they per are perceived as belonging to the generalized category of women, rendering other aspects of their identities irrelevant. The sectarian biological view of women after 1947 contributed to the dogged campaign of both the Indian and Pakistani states to locate and return abductive, abductive women to their pre-partition communities regardless of how they themselves understood their identities after the redrawing of national bound borders. According to official accounts, 259 women and children were, and I'm using the language of the state here, uh, were recovered from Pakistan and returned to Jammu and Kashmir, whereas 211 women and children were recovered from India in Jammu and Kashmir and returned to Pakistan. The splitting of the subcontinent did not confer the right of self-determination or security on all living within the borders of the newly created nation states. <laughs> British India consisted of a patchwork of territories governed by the Raj and nominally independent princely states which were to accede to either India or Pakistan on the basis of the religious composition of their population and contiguity of borders. Based on this criterion, Muslim majority of Jammu and Kashmir, which bordered then West Pakistan, should have been incorporated into Pakistan. However, its Hindu ruler, Maharaja Hari Singh, initially refused, holding out for independence. Indigenous revolts against him by the Punis and Mirpuris motivated him to ask the Indian government for military assistance. The Indian government agreed, provided that Singh cited instrument of accession, a condition which he accepted contingent on the guarantee of special status and some autonomy for the region, codified in Articles 370 of the Indian Constitution. Jammu and Kashmir was allowed to have its own constitution, flag, and constituent assembly. In 1954, a presidential proclamation added Article 35A, granting residents of the state exclusive rights to property ownership and jobs in the state. 
The accession agreement also contained a promise of a UN supervised plebiscite to ascertain the preferences of people in the state regarding to accession to India or Pakistan. That plebiscite has never been honored. Subsequently, three of the four wars between India and Pakistan have been fought over Kashmir. The ongoing conflict in Kashmir is often coded as a territorial dispute between these two countries, a characterization that obscures Kashmiri aspirations for autonomy from both countries. More than anything, Kashmiris would like to be left alone by both India and Pakistan. Fast forward to current day Kashmir and the center's revocation of Articles 370 and 35A under the leadership of Prime Minister Narendra Modi, an avowed Hindu nationalist who has a long who is a longtime member of the fascist Rashtriya Swaya Sevak Sangh, the parent organization of the ruling BJP. Modi's election in 2014 and his re-election in 2019, by a significant margin, are symptomatic of the ascendance of Hindu majoritarianism in national life. The status of religious minorities, of Muslims, of Christians, of Dalits and Sikhs, has become even more precarious as they become frequent targets of communal violence. Modi himself, while cleared by the Supreme Court, re remains under suspicion of being complicit in the pogroms against Muslims in 2002 when approximately 2,000 were killed during his tenure as Chief Minister of Gujarat. Along with his party, he dreams and aspires to make India into a Hindu nation. As if on cue, several BJP politicians celebrated the revocation of Articles 370 and, 330 and 35A engendered and racialized pronouncements that evoke the sexualized violence of partition. Vikram Singh Saini, a high school dropout, who was a member of the Legislative Assembly of Uttar Pradesh, rejoiced over the change in Kashmir's status, exulting, quote, Muslim workers should celebrate. They can get married to care of Kashmiri girls. There should be celebrations. Everyone should celebrate, be it Hindus or Muslims, end quote. In a 2018 speech, Sandy had encouraged Hindus to have as many children as possible, a privilege that he did not extend to other religious communities. He is also on record as declaring that, quote, Hindustan, which is uh, the word that's one of the words in India that's used for India, Hindustan is for Hindus, end quote, and urging Muslims to move to Pakistan. In another incident, BJP Chief Minister of Haryana, Manohar Lal Khattar, joked that the revocation of Article 370 meant that Kashmiri women could now be imported into the state to redress the abysmal sex ratio, a consequence of high rates of female infanticide in the state. One of the most horrifyingly and frankly bizarre statements by a BJ mem BJP member was voiced at a 2017 rally featuring the rapidly anti-Muslim yogi Adityanath, now Chief Minister of Uttar Pradesh. A speaker at this rally incited Islamophobic and gendered violence saying, quote, Muslim women should be taken from their graves and raped, end quote. When I first read this quotation, I thought that its utter depravity did not require any comment, given that the defilement of the dead is a near universal aspect of the human condition. I want to underscore, however, that the quotation reveals how rape and violence against women do not even signify as a form of physical contact. In other words, caste restrictions prohibit bodily contact with non-Hindus and lower caste groups, particularly those who are associated with occupations that entail contact with human waste, corpses, and animal carcasses. The BJP members' injunction to rape Muslim women's corpses does not express any concern with caste contamination, illustrating how animus towards Muslims, and I would argue women, trumps spheres of pollution. Echoing Sunny's construction of Kashmiri women as marriageable commodities, social media has been replete with content from what Piyashri Deskup the Dubs, quote, slightly desperate Hindu men, end quote, rejoicing that they can now, quote, get girls, end quote, from Kashmir in the wake of Article 370's revocation. As Daskupta points out, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok feature posts with similar tropes, smiley face emojis, Hindu icons, and pictures of Kashmiri girls and women with captions advertising their availability as wives. All of these images feature a 370 hashtag. So let me just um, see. So for example, in this one, um, let's see. Uh, surrender Romeo to your Kashmiri wife. Uh, this post evokes the aesthetic of Bollywood cinema with the cool heroes sporting sunglasses 
and a guitar slung over his shoulder here um, in the corner of the frame. Here the light-skinned Kashmiri woman is wagging her finger at the male, ostensibly in a playful fashion as signified by her smile, and I would like to believe she's actually scolding him for his approach to spelling. Um, so, Um, in this post, the, the phrase is Sasurwal Kumara, which means your in-laws. We get a picture of three young women in what looks suspiciously like school uniforms, underscoring their youth. Notably, there are no males in this picture. The caption suggests that the lucky Indian man will have access to all the women in the visual frame, speaking to a cliched orientalist male fantasy of sexual plenitude in Muslim households. Both this illustration and the previous one construct Kashmiri women as receptive to these sexual overtures as evidenced by the women's smiles. Okay. Um, in the third illustration, Kashmiri women have been erased from the visual frame altogether and are represented through written Devanagari. And the ca caption here is, now I can get married to a Kashmiri girl, Article 370. Instead, we get Hindu symbolism as the assertion of the Hindu male prerogative. The saffron background will resonate with Hindus insofar, insofar as it is a sacred color associated with sacrifice and the god of me. In addition, this frame features an icon of Shiva, who is the destroyer in the Hindu triumvirate. Um, in the Hindu triumvirate, he also embodies the binary contradiction of being both the god of sexual asceticism and the god of fertility, symbolized in the ritual worship of statues of the phallus. And the hashtag here includes the phrase, Jai Shri Ram, Victory to Ram. Okay, so the picture of light-skinned girls and women in these social media images illustrates Sandy's claim that access to fair Kashmiri females is a laudable result of the abrogation of the Constitution. We need to remember that the adjective fair, the adjective fair operates on two registers. Fair as in skin color and fair as in the beauty of the kind that Mon describes of the comely mountain lasses. The threat of violence is thinly veiled in these posts that assert the Hindu male's right to Kashmiri women, which evokes the horror of partition. For women, partition has meant several lessons. First, ethno-religious difference can make one a target of violence. And two, sexual assault can, fu can function as an awful rite of conversion, a violent baptism into a new ethno-religious identity. To be blunt, rape becomes the means for the national assimilation of difference for both Pakistan and India. The lascivious responses of Hindu men to the revocation of Articles 370 today evoke the partition era imprinting of national identity on women through sexual coercion. In this case, full integration into India requires Kashmiri women to marry Hindu men. Implicit in this model of assimilation is that the children of such unions will be Hindu. At the same time, Hindu nationalists have raised alarms of the threat embodied by what's quote, uh, called, quote, love jihad, end quote, charging that Muslim men are seducing innocent Hindu women. The logic here is of a piece with the view of ethno-nationalists that miscegenation can be a tool of genocide. They believe it is possible to dilute the ethno-religious blood quantum sufficiently to render the minority portion irrelevant. The center has also revoked Article 35A, which prohibits property ownership by non-Kashmiris under the cynical justification that this will spur development. And you can hear echoes of this in um, Saya's presentation that she made earlier about the development schemes in Northeast India. In the New York Times editorial, Harsh Burden Stringla, the Indian ambassador to the U.S., piously declares that the government's actions, quote, open the door to rejuvenate a moribund economy and promote horticulture, tourism, and handicrafts that are a unique strength of Kashmir's culture, end quote. Analyzing how the Indian military uses development as a tool of counterinsurgency, Monaban cautions for the necessity of understanding how the state's rhetoric of compassion and care can mask the expansion of its power to control people in conflict zones. We should be skeptical of the Indian government's claims of the capacity of agriculture, the service sector, and cottage industries to lift a significant number of people out of poverty given that these sectors typically rely on a precarious workforce. The development justification is an unsubtle public relations ploy aimed at an international audience. 
The revocation of Article 35A will most likely benefit Indians who can now flock to the mountains and buy property in Kashmir while residents in the state remain impoverished. Among Kashmiris and their supporters, there are legitimate fears that the projected influx of Indians will alter the demographic balance, making them minorities in their own land. And this fear ironically mirrors alarmist Hindutva rhetoric against Muslims as potentially outnumbering Hindus through higher birth rates. Indeed, the migration of wealthy outsiders into the region, social inequalities exacerbated, and a military occupation add up to a settler colonialism determined to actualize Indian capital at the expense of Kashmiri aspirations for self-determination and the right to live in dignity. To paraphrase Stuart Paul, the challenge for us will be to understand the differences between racial formations in a British colonial setting and in a context where the Indian post-colonial state is simultaneously a settler, a colonial settler state. We need to comprehend the construction of race as part of the indigenous labor force and regime of accum accumulation within the domestic economy. Nonetheless, I would be remiss if I neglected to acknowledge that the contemporary Indian and Pakistani armies still follow the recruitment patterns established by the British with one exception. According to Omar Khalidi, in the case of India, the so-called martial races are overrepresented in the armed forces, particularly the Sikhs and Gurkhas, but the population of Muslims who were included in the martial races has dropped precipitously from 30 to 36% of the colonial army to around 1% of the, at the beginning of the 21st century. Going back to 1947, the Indian government fretted that Muslim soldiers potentially constituted a Trojan horse in a war with Pakistan. In the last two decades, sympathy for Hindu nationalism has also grown among senior army officials. Khalidi warns that the Kashmir insurgency since 1989, um, and I'm quoting from him here, has a direct bearing on the Indian army and paramilitary forces' attitude toward Muslims in India. Since the Indian Army does not mirror the national population in its rank and file, there is reason to doubt its continued neutrality in domestic Hindu-Muslim disputes, given the adverse impact of the Kashmir conflict on communal relations in both. Under the 1990 Armed Forces Special Powers Act, the Army has been enjoying immunity for its gross human rights violations in Kashmir for the past three decades casting doubt on whether it was ever neutral in its policing of civilian populations in the Bat Valley. The ecstatic reception of the revocation of Articles 370 and 35A for providing access to fair Kashmiri girls illustrates how the colonial ethno-religious classifications, militarism, and Hindu nationalism shape the toxic construction that is raised in India today. Thank you. Very impactful for the injustice of the nation, you know, on both sides of the border, although in, so on focused on the Indian nation is more. I think you apply to both camps, right? So um please any questions or thoughts about you know uh, uh, pretty much the presentation today. For a bit more information, I've never heard before of martial race theory as a historical phenomenon, but I recognised it immediately from uh, the Antipodean con context, where Maori were feared and respected as a martial race, whereas Aboriginal Australians were regarded as weak and gentle and sickly. Um, where did that come from in the broad spectrum of uh, late 19th century race? Theory is, yeah. um, so it emerges in the subcontinent after the Indian Mutiny in 1857, and there were before then there were you know I, the British they did sort of categorize South Asians in different ethnicities and races by tools such as the census, um, but the martial race theory really emerges after the mutiny. And what they did was they wanted to try to um, mitigate against the possibility of other rebellions against um, the you know, British occupation. So what they did was they wanted to recruit um, 
their soldiers from those groups that had been loyal to the crown during the mutiny. And in order to do that, they sort of created this discourse of these people, like the Dogras, the Rajputs, the Punjabis, the Sikhs, are um, better warriors than the unmanly Bengalis, because, um, for example, the Bengalis and some of the uh, northeastern um, groups had actually rebelled against the British. And so you sit, sort of get this cultural divide. Um, and that's really when it starts to emerge in the late 19th century. <coughs> that I don't know. Yeah, I think it is some, because remember too that in general, eugenics was really coming into its own in the late 19th century. And so all of these theories were kind of dovetailing these wild climate theories, these theories of anthropology and the measurements of the brain. And so, you know, all sorts of really strange and what to our eyes look like quite bizarre theories of race are in the air. Any other questions or comments? I guess I uh, thank you so much for your talk. It's really uh, very powerful, and um, you know, I think it really gives us a point to think about. Uh, one, one thing that for me um, that, that brought to mind was um, the conversation in uh, Euripides is the Trojan women, right? When the Trojan, uh, you know, uh, women in the, in the royal family are basically talking about their fates as the concubines of, of the Greeks, right? And I think it was Andromache who says that, well, they say that one, if you spend one night with your new master, your mind changes, right? And that you will be able to make peace with your, um, with your new life. And then she also says, well, but I don't want that to happen to me, and I hope that it doesn't happen to me. And, and so there's something really quite, um, I think, very disturbing that, that really challenges, I think, our, our modern categories of subjectivity. And when we look at instances like this, right, that it seems as though there's some aspect of archaic life that is still with us, right? Um, especially when you brought up the example of women who, you know, were kidnapped by the other side and chose to remain, right? That that's a, that's some, that seems to me that's something that's very hard for us as modern people who really believe in autonomy to accept. Although, as you as you point out, I mean, these women would have had very good reasons, you know, for not, you know, for for not going back to their Hindu households or not going back to their a Muslim household, and, I, and I'm wondering, like, like how do we? Um, I don't know. Is there some way for us to, uh, like, you know, to, to try to grasp this more, um, more, um, more deeply? I mean, it seems to me that if we were were to have a deeper understanding of this, it would help us, I think, to understand um, and you know, sort of the hidden forces at work in so many conflicts. This is a hard um, question or, I guess, comment to respond to because that is one of the um, big questions is why would anybody stay with somebody who has assaulted them sexually? And uh, I think here we just kind of have, and the thing is that there just aren't that many accounts of, of the reasoning because the women don't want to remember. They, they build new lives for themselves and because um, there's so much uh, shame associated with sexual violence, and I think because they were isolated in their in these new in these communities because they had been either their families had been killed or they had been abandoned, and so you know they were literally surviving by um, being enfolded and creating these new families and communities. Okay, but in the case of Hector's wife and Ronaki. Yeah. Right, it's been having a lot children. Of since I read right, it's, it's a, a, well, actually it's having children that may, reconciles her to her new, um, yes. you know, like situation. Right, it, it's um, I mean, you know, as miserable as she is, it's the fact that she becomes a mother of like three sons. You know, um, and her of course her own son by um, Hector is thrown off the wall of Troy. Right, right? Um, uh, and and so. Um, and so it seems to me that it's that your your talk in that sense links together. I think what has been kind of an implicit concern um, in opposition that I see in, in the conference. And one is that um, okay, well there are groups that are worried about the future and they attack minorities or migrants because they are worried about the future. And then on the other hand, we have groups that are really fearful of, of going extinct, right? Um, and so that seems to be and and, that, and to me that points to some kind of fundamental. Um, crisis within modernity, which is that modern modernity does not seem to be able to um, reproduce itself. 
right? Like we seem to have reached a point in modernity where um, the, the, the very facts, the values of modern life are now putting us into, into some sort of fundamental crisis. Right? And, and so it's weirdly hopeful in a way, right? That maybe it is possible to love children so much that you can forget about all the sort of terrible things that, that happen to you. I mean, isn't that in some sense the key to human survival? I would say yes. Why would you have found that? Uh, thank you so much for your talk. I'm not um, very familiar with the cash institution, so your talk was really enlightening, especially on how you um, kind of flipped the martial race theory from the masculine uh, dominance to seeing how the cash women are being appropriated. Um, and so my question is mostly about how this kind of propaganda on online about uh, Hindu men trying to marry Kashmiri women. Because for me, I think the more conventional um, Eurocentric trope is the ethnic minority man trying to marry the white woman in order to, and, and that fear, it factors into how the British like wanted to like, keep their women, and keeping their women would be a symbol of trying to uh, protect their nationalism. So I was wondering, is there a fear of like Kashmiri men trying to take on Hindu women for their lives. Um, does that fear factor into <coughs> some kind of gender violence intersecting with national identity? Well, I think in um, the uh, mainland of India, there is this whole discourse of love jihad. So this fear that Muslim men are you know, seducing these very innocent Hindu girls. Um, but I think in terms of the desire for wives here, what's crucial here is the emphasis on fear. Because in India, there's quite a bit of colorism. And so what gets about, and uh, Radhika Parmeshwaran, who's a colleague at Indiana University, she's written extensively about this. But there, what would be considered um, high, white skin, fair skin is highly valued. And so there, that's the attraction of the Kashmiri women. But I think, too, it's a way of asserting um, dominance over Muslim men, Muslim Kashmiri men, by saying, hey, we have a right to your women. Okay, would you please give a uh, uh, applause of two comments? <laughs> and uh, before I declare a tea break, Dr. Song has a very important announcement to make.